IAP colloquium. So uh, Marcus Salers uh, got his PhD in Desi Ambo with Andreas uh, Ringwald. Then he moved as a postdoctoral fellow in several institutes, the University of Oxford, uh, Stony Brook. And then he moved on to University of Wisconsin with the prestigious uh, John Bacall fellowship, postdoctoral fellowship. And for a few years now, he's uh, been an assistant professor in the Niels Bohr Institute in Copenhagen. And so Marcus has been a long-term member of the IceCube collaboration, which is the, the main uh, neutrino observatory now uh, uh, internationally. Uh, on the international level. And he's recognized as one of the leading experts actually in the field of neutrino astronomy, because Marcus has, uh, has made key contributions on the connections between neutrinos, gamma rays, and cosmic rays astrophysics. And those, are, uh, those form actually the basis of high energy multi-messenger astronomy. I should say that also that the research interest of Marcus covered a, a broad range of topics in this field. So, and it's a, uh, what is uh, truly remarkable, I think, is that it's uh, uh, both experimental and also uh, hardcore theoretical uh, work. And so neutrino astronomy, is, uh, as you may know, is uh, currently a very active field of research, given that the origin of those neutrinos, which carry a typical energy of the order of 10 to the 15 electron volts, has remained elusive so far. And uh, so please, Marcus, you will tell us uh, all the secrets of this uh, neutrino universe. So. Yeah. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for this nice introdu uh, introduction. And also, thank you for the invitation. Let me try to share my slides with you. I hope you can see this. And I have to move the faces here to the side a little bit. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, thank you very much. So, um, I'm going to talk today about uh, recent observation in high energy neutrino uh, observatory and I will focus here on observations of neutrinos that has happened in the past decade with the uh, neutrino, uh, the ice cube telescope at the, the South Pole. That's the motivation for this title, Neutrinos on the Rocks. So I will uh, uh, try to summarize these findings uh, and uh, also try to put this into a uh, the theoretical context of multi-messenger astronomy what we can learn from neutrino observations on uh, the origin of gamma rays and cosmic rays, but also how we can use uh, gamma rays and uh, cosmic rays uh, to understand the neutrino emission that we see so far. So uh, this is a colloquium, so let me start uh, uh, slowly by uh, giving you a motivation uh, of high energy neutrino astronomy. Neutrino astronomy is of course one of the pillars of uh, multi-messenger astronomy. And uh, the type of source that we would like to observe in multi-messenger astronomy is uh, shown here on the left-hand side of, of the slide. So you can imagine um, a binary neutron star merger, which as it merges uh, produces, of course, uh, a signal in gravitational waves. And we have seen um, uh, examples of these gravitational wave sources now with LIGO and Virgo. But in the aftermath uh, of, this, uh, of these mergers, you can also uh, create environments that lead to jetted outflows of uh, hot plasma. Uh, in the case of binary neutron star mergers, we, we believe that this is associated to short gamma ray uh, bursts and also kilo nova. And uh, in these uh, jetted outflows, uh, you are probably aware that you can produce uh, astrophysical shocks uh, together with random magnetic fields. These are environments that can lead to the acceleration of charged particles electrons will uh, um, emit synchronous emission, uh, Bremsstrahlung, and this Compton scattering. So this would be leptonic photons, which are generated by uh, lepton acceleration. But you can also imagine that uh, hadrons, for example, protons, which are present in the shock, will also be accelerated by the same mechanism. And as these cosmic rays are interacting with photons or with, with gas in the environment, they can produce pions, which are unstable uh, mesons. And these pions decay, uh, neutral pions will decay to photons. Uh, so this, these are then hadronic gamma rays. Uh, and charged pions will decay uh, to um, neutrinos. So a source which is uh, something like a, a neutron star merger uh, can be expected to have uh, some contribution to all these cosmic uh, messengers. So what is so interesting about the high energy neutrino emission itself so neutrinos are in some sense ideal uh, cosmic messengers because they are not getting deflected by any magnetic fields uh, like cosmic rays. 
Uh, and because they are not deflected by magnetic fields, they are also coincident with photons and gravitational waves uh, produced at the same uh, time. Uh, so this is uh, very great if you want to do real-time uh, transient uh, uh, multi-messenger observations. And because uh, neutrinos are weakly interacting particles, they are basically not absorbed by any cosmic backgrounds, gas or radiation, unlike gamma rays. So for gamma rays at very high energies, you have strong interactions with the cosmic microwave background that leads to electromagnetic cascades. And uh, observation of high energy neutrinos will also allow us to um, uh, uncover the sources, of, uh, uh, the sources of cosmic rays, which are otherwise not observable directly due to this deflection of cosmic rays and magnetic fields. But because neutrinos are weakly interacting, they are very difficult to detect. So you have to build very large observatories. And uh, as Martin already pointed out in the introduction, presently the, uh, the most sensitive observatory for high energy neutrinos in the uh, tera electron volt to peta electron volt, so 10 to the power 12 to 10 to the power 15 electron volt energy range, is the uh, neutrino observatory located at the South Pole. So it's a, it's a fairly simple setup. Uh, we went to the South Pole. And uh, you have a thick uh, glacier at the South Pole, which have, has a thickness of uh, three kilometers. And uh, uh, we melt holes into the ice. So these are indicated here by the grayish uh, lines uh, until we uh, reach the bedrock uh, at about uh, three kilometers depth. And then we deploy optical uh, modules uh, that are uh, attached to readout cables, so-called strings in these uh, holes which are filled with water and then we just wait until the the hole freezes back in and then we have our detector setup so these optical modules these are uh, photo multiplier tubes which are extremely sensitive to uh, optical light emission in the ice and what we are trying to observe is the uh, Cherenkov emission of charged particles which are uh, created uh, by neutrino interactions in the vicinity of the detector so maybe out of all the, the numbers that I can, all the details I can give you about the ice loop experiment uh, is, is the, the total price of this experiment. It's actually very cheap in comparison. It's only like uh, one, one quarter of a, a euro uh, per ton. So try to compare this to ATLAS or CMS. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so the total size of the detector is about one uh, cubic kilometer. So. Uh, it's a hexagonal uh, shape uh, with a, a depth of about one kilometer. And the string spacing is of the order of 125 meters. So uh, what are the type of signals that we want to see with ice cube? Uh, so neutrinos at very high energies, they interact via uh, deep inelastic scattering. So they scatter off um, quarks uh, bound in nucleons in the ice. And uh, they break up these nucleons and produce hadronic cascades. And these hadronic cascades will, of course, produce charged particles at very high energies, and they emit Cherenkov lights. So the type of uh, signal, uh, so-called bread and butter signals, that we see very often in ice group is neutral current interactions of all neutrino flavors. They can be visible by these hadronic cascades from the breakup of the nucleons. But we also have charged current interactions of electron and uh, tau neutrinos. Here again, we see the hadronic uh, cascades uh, from the initial interaction. But then the electron itself will produce an electromagnetic cascade, and also the tau can produce leptonic and uh, hadronic uh, cascades. But uh, keep in mind, 125 meter distance between our strings, uh, you really need to separate these cascades by large amounts to really uh, be able to observe these indi individual cascades. Uh, and then for the, uh, for the sake of neutrino astronomy, the most interesting type of event is the charge current interaction of neo neutrino. Uh, this will produce muons that uh, are, of course, uh, short-lived particles, but due to the large uh, Lorentz factor of these particles, they can actually travel large distances. So even if the neutrino is produced very far away from the detector, you can still see a muon track crossing the detector. And you can imagine that these tracks have a fairly good angular resolution compared to uh, the cascade events. Now, there are also some special uh, events, and I'm going to mention some recent observations in ice group uh, looking for these special events. If you have a tau neutrino, then uh, in charge current interactions, the tau neutrino will produce a tau. And if you reach very high energies of the order of peta electron volt, 
then uh, the lifetime of the tau can be long enough that uh, the tau separates from the initial cascades that you can see the second cascades. And so this gives us interesting uh, new features to um, extract tau neutrino events from our data. Depending on the energy, the separation can be large. And then we have double bang events uh, or even lollipop events. But at lower energies, if the tau decays earlier, we have maybe double pulse events that we can see in our optical modules if the time resolution is good enough. Then, uh, so the, the classical way to, um, to um, observe neutrino sources in the universe is um, by looking for uh, uh, tracks uh, produced by uh, muon neutrino charge current interaction in the vicinity of the detector. And here we are looking for tracks that, that are upgoing, so which, which are coming from the point of view of uh, ice field at the South Pole from the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, we know now that there are uh, astrophysical uh, neutrino uh, sources in the universe emitting in the TeV to PeV range, and they emit at uh, a rate of uh, about 10 events per year that we can observe uh, in ice field. So this is a, a very low statistics uh, signal. And uh, this is something that you have to compare to the enormous background that we see from cosmic ray interaction in the atmosphere. So the cosmic ray interactions in the atmosphere produce uh, per year about 16 billion events. And uh, fortunately, if we are only selecting those events which are coming through the Earth, then the muons which are produced in the atmosphere crossing our detector, they will be observed if the cosmic ray interacts in the northern hemisphere. This still leaves us uh, with uh, uh, neutrinos which are also produced by cosmic ray interactions. They, of course, similar to astrophysical neutrinos, can cross the diameter of the Earth and then produce an upgoing a track signal. Unfortunately, um, we see a large amount of these atmospheric uh, muon neutrinos uh, at the level of 100,000 per year. So this is still much larger than the 10 uh, neutrinos that we see from astrophysical sources. But these atmospheric neutrinos have a very steep spectrum, steeply falling spectrum. And so if uh, the at astrophysical neutrino flux has a hard spectrum close to e to the power minus 2, as you would expect from Fermi acceleration, then there should be a transition between the atmospheric background and the high energy background. So this is uh, the classical uh, way of observing high energy neutrino sources. In ICU, we have also an alternative possibility. Uh, we can actually, uh, so due to the dense infill of our detector with optical modules, which are indicated here by these little spheres, we can actually define an outer veto layer and we can um, um, tag events uh, that appear in the detector, or if we can veto these events uh, appearing in the detector, if they're actually crossing this veto layer. And this is a very interesting method because this allows us to extract atmospheric neutrinos, which are otherwise undistinguishable uh, from uh, astrophysical neutrino sources. Because if these cosmic ray interactions are happening above your detector, they will be uh, in coincidence with atmospheric muon bundles that are showering down in your detector. And these muon bundles will trigger the veto, and so atmospheric neutrinos become filtered out. Events like uh, cosmic neutrinos coming uh, from, uh, out, uh, from above the detector as well as below the detector, they will not be triggering this veto. And uh, so this allows us to get rid of some of these atmospheric backgrounds of 100,000 atmospheric uh, neutrinos that I was talking about in the previous slide. So uh, in IceCube, uh, we have now detected astrophysical neutrinos with uh, both of these channels. But the first one that led to the first discovery in the year 2013 was the so-called high energy starting event analysis, where we use the outer layer as a veto. And here are two nice examples uh, of this uh, detection. Here on the left, you see a, charge, uh, a muon neutrino charge current interaction, a, a muon neutrino coming here in from the left-hand side. And here you see the initial hadronic cascade. Uh, red means early Trenkov light detection. Blue means late Trenkov uh, uh, light em emission. So initially, you see the signal here. And then the high energy muon, which is created, is moving to the right outside the detector. And uh, so this is an event here that deposits about 70 uh, tera electron volt. Uh, and this uh, is very close to the neutrino energy of the initial uh, neutrino. And here you can imagine that the uh, uh, resolution for the reconstruction of the initial neutrino is, is fairly good because the muon, which is produced by this high interaction, will preserve the initial direction of the neutrino. 
And here on the right hand side, you see another example of a, a cascade event. So this is actually a very energetic event of one peta electron volt. And uh, this is producing a mostly uh, spherical Trankov light emission in the detector because Trankov photons and also secondary um, electrons are scattering in the ice. So uh, only in the, in the center of this uh, Trankov emission, you will really be able to make out the initial direction of neutrinos. If you, if you look uh, for late photons, this would be basically a spherical emission. But these type of events are, are very great if you want to have a calorimetric measurements of the neutrino energy. So these, uh, by now we have uh, seen high energy neutrinos, not only by, as uh, starting tracks, but also in the upgoing uh, neutrino channel. And um, it's very interesting to, to look for the total uh, isotropic flux of high energy neutrinos in the TV PV range, which is indicated here. The different red, magenta, and, and purple line, uh, these are coming from different observation channels. And uh, these channels all agree on uh, the, the absolute level of the neutrino flux. There is some uncertainty in terms of spectral features. Um, so some analysis predict a somewhat uh, harder neutrino emission compared to other analysis. But the overall level of the neutrino emission is, is fairly well uh, established. And this is a, a more than five sigma discovery by now. And if you compare this now to other um, astrophysical messengers like the, the isotropic gamma ray background observed with Fermi, and also the, the tail of ultra high energy cosmic rays that are, for example, observed with Auger, you notice that uh, the total intensity, the energy level of these neutrinos are actually uh, comparable to gamma rays and uh, cosmic ray backgrounds. So this is here a, a plot uh, which is showing the flux of the particle times energy square. So this becomes proportional to the total energy density of uh, these particles in the universe. So the fact that we see uh, different energy levels has actually very interesting implication in terms of multi-messenger astronomy. There can be a very strong connection between these messengers and I will highlight one of these connections to gamma rays uh, in the second part of my talk. So um, neutrinos, are, um, they, they are, they're not only carrying information in terms of their energy, but also their flavor. So uh, it's, it's interesting to, uh, to compare the uh, expected production mechanism and what the production mechanism of neutrinos tells us about different uh, neutrino flavors, electron, muon, and tau neutrino flavors, and what we observe in our detector. And we have some sensitivity to flavor because tracks that we observe are mostly coming from muon neutrino charge current interactions, whereas uh, the observation in cascades give us an overall um, um, measure of the sum of all uh, neutrino flavors. So, but of course, uh, neutrinos are a very particular particles that uh, mix due to the superposition, non-trivial superposition of flavor and mass eigenstates, and also the fact that neutrino mass, masses are not the same. So they start to oscillate. So for example, if you have a source that produces a, a pure electron neutrino beam here in red, so the first entry here is the electron neutrino, it's one to zero, zero then this initial flavor composition will start to oscillate uh, from the source. So what is then actually the flavor that we can observe in the detector? Um, for that, you have to realize that neutrinos are actually produced following a spectrum. So it's, it's very uh, untypical for astrophysical sources to produce neutrino line emission. So, uh, and if you imagine that you have a very distant source that produces um, neutrinos with slightly different energies, for example, here I show you the example of um, in green, a neutrino which is produced at 100 TeV, and the red neutrino is slightly red shifted to 99 TeV, and the blue one is slightly blue shifted to 101 TeV. And you see after they are emitted from the source, uh, they are actually following the same oscillation patterns, but they are becoming delayed. Now our detector ice cube has a, an energy resolution of the order of 10%. So it is impossible to distinguish a 101 TeV neutrino from that uh, with nine, 99 TeV. So that means we can only really see the oscillation average in our detector. And so the oscillation average, for example, of uh, the uh, production of neutrinos from pions, which produce one electron neutrino, two muon neutrinos and no tau neutrinos, they will be visible in ice cube in terms of their oscillation average. 
and that is very central in this uh, flavor diagram. Uh, maybe I should have pointed out, I'm sorry, this is, a, this is a ternary diagram. Every point in this triangle is basically parametrizing the relative contribution of electron, uh, muon, and tau neutrinos. But of course, the total sum of these flavors is always adding up to uh, one. So the central point here would correspond to uh, like one to one to one uh, composition in terms of electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And you can think about other mechanisms of uh, producing neutrinos, for example, uh, muon neutrino beams, if you have very strong magnetic fields, this could, could be the case if pions produce, uh, loses energy via synchrotron emission before they decay, or if you have uh, neutron decay producing electron beams, all these initial flavor compositions uh, will end up very centrally in this flavor diagram. And here in blue, you see our uh, current uh, estimate of uh, the uh, observed flavor ratios. And these are actually mostly uh, consistent in particular with the pion production scenario. So this is a very nice uh, particle physics check uh, um, uh, of our observation. Now we also have now other ways to, to study astrophysical neutrinos. There's one particular example where uh, neutrinos are not predominantly interacting via chart, uh, by a deep inelastic scattering. Uh, uh, but uh, if you have also uh, electron antineutrino neutrino contributions in your astrophysical mix, then these uh, electron antineutrinos neutrinos can interact with electrons in the ice. And uh, at a neutrino energy of about six uh, peta electron volt, this uh, is actually um, uh, dominated by the so-called glacial resonance. So the neutrino uh, scatters off an electron, produces a W, and then the W can decay lep uh, leptonically or hadronically. And we have now seen one example of a cascade in ice cube. This is a cascade that started outside the detector and then the chunk of light uh, comes into the detector. And we can estimate the energy of this event, uh, which is shown here on the, on the top plot. And the energy here is uh, of the order of 6 PeV. This is, this is exactly this energy of the glacial resonance that we would expect to see. And we also have evidence that uh, the decay of, of uh, so if this was a glacial resonance, that the decay of the W would be uh, hadronically because we see some early light in our uh, Cherenkov uh, modules from, from muons, which are uh, surfing the, uh, the, uh, the shower front of the Cherenkov particles of electrons. So this is uh, uh, evidence for uh, the contribution of electron antineutrinos in the, uh, the signal. And from the total number of events that we observed in, with this channel so far, this is also consistent with the other flux measurements that I showed you earlier. And then finally, we also, uh, I mentioned these special tau neutrino events. We also have uh, indications of these tau neutrino candidates in ice cube. This is here showing one uh, cascade uh, events from the high energy starting event sample. And uh, what you see here in these inset uh, pictures are the arrival time of Cherenkov photons uh, of optical modules, which are very close to the first interaction vertex of the neutrino. And you see here from the data, uh, there's evidence of uh, like a delayed wave of Cherenkov emission. And uh, this is consistent with this picture that uh, you, you, you produce a tau neutrino, uh, sorry, you have a tau neutrino charge current interaction producing a tau, and then the tau has a, a delayed decay in the detector producing a second wave of Cherenkov photons. And we have uh, now with our data two examples of these events. And uh, if we uh, include also this tau neutrino channel in our flavor analysis, we end up uh, with a, a plot that uh, looks like uh, the black line here. So our best fit now is moving more towards the, the center of the flavor uh, triangle again, consistent with our expectation from the standard astrophysical sources via pion decay. Okay, so, um, but what about neutrino astronomy? So this was particle physics, what, what about the signal? So we have now, uh, uh, of course, observed these neutrinos and we have tried to um, uh, decipher the arrival direction of these events. And this is here showing a distribution in terms of galactic coordinates of the various detection channels. In red, you see upgoing track events, neutrino neutrino events, and in, in magenta, you see uh, events from the high energy starting event analysis. Uh, some of these events, uh, the cascades, have a very poor angular resolution of the order of 10 degrees. 
So this is like, uh, you know, 40 times the moon across the sky. So this is uh, maybe not that good for astronomy, but uh, if you have a high statistics sample, you can still make use of these uh, events. And uh, so uh, we have, of course, studied in IceCube uh, very thoroughly if there is some evidence for uh, correlation of these neutrinos with known sources or if there are some uh, cluster of events in uh, parts of the sky. And the bottom line here is so far, we have not identified with very high uh, significance astrophysical neutrino source emitter. There's one uh, candidate that I'm going to cover later on, a, a gamma ray blazer called TXS0506 plus 056. This might be the first neutrino source. So the situation uh, that we have in IceCube now is maybe very similar to uh, early uh, gamma ray astronomy. So this is here um, a, a sample of gamma ray events uh, observed with the orbiting solar observatory in 1967 in galactic coordinates again. And if you squint your eyes, you can maybe already make out that there is some enhanced emission along the galactic plane. Uh, and uh, of course, 50 years later, uh, we have much better instruments and of course with, for example, Fermi, we have a much better uh, um, way to find individual sources in our own galaxy or uh, also extragalactic sources of the galactic plane. So hopefully in neutrino astronomy we will also reach this point. Uh, we probably also have to wait 50 years to come to a picture like that. So we, uh, we have a, a search program in IceCube looking for... Excuse me. So, sorry, Marcus, I think some... Is it Andy, uh, Marcus? You want to ask? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Marcus, it's very interesting. There's a lot of information. Could you maybe just summarize again for us yeah. how you know for sure that you've got an astrophysical event inside the neutrino detectors? Yeah. So um, uh, there. Are, um, so the the way that we estimate. Uh, let's let me let me go back to this plot here. So what you see here, this is the, the best fit uh, measurement of our isotropic uh, diffuse flux, so integrated over the whole sky. And uh, uh, the way this, uh, the significance of this emission is inferred is in terms of a likelihood analysis. So we have atmospheric models, and uh, here we have a, a large contribution coming from atmospheric uh, neutrinos. And, but we know fairly well that the atmospheric neutrino flux uh, follows a power law that goes like um, e to the power minus 3.7. So this is one order of magnitude steeper than the cosmic ray flux. So I, I don't show here the atmospheric background, uh, but uh, if you see my cursor, this would basically chop off here. Uh, or it, it will correspond to a falling spectrum here to the left-hand side. And uh, in our statistical analysis, we see uh, that, uh, we, that we have a second component in uh, the observed um, energy distribution of events that is becoming harder. And uh, so this, this um, um, observation of a second harder component allows us to make uh, um, a, statistically, uh, a, a, st a, st a statistical statement about the significance of this uh, second astrophysical component. Okay, great, thanks. There's also uh, for the for the high energy. So it's it's not only the energy. It's also the the. Uh, so we we are make, basically making a two D analysis, also taking into account the arrival direction of the events, and uh, in particular for this high energy starting event analysis, where we can filter out atmospheric contribution, uh, we have an additional handle of these strong uh, astro uh, atmospheric contributions. And uh, from the distribution of these events uh, in terms of zenith, we can also see a, a consistent distribution that uh, for, the, for the high energy events that they should originate from an astrophysical population of sources. Yeah. Thank you. And okay, Is, are there any other questions? Um, okay, then. Uh, yeah, so we, uh, but it's actually a good, good point uh, that you bring up. So as a reminder, we, we have a very significant observation of an isotropic flux integrated off the sky. And uh, this is somehow in contrast to the fact that we have actually not seen many individual neutrino sources. Yeah? So this is kind of a, like a, a bit of a puzzling observation. And uh, we have, of course, uh, a dedicated working group in, in, in IceCube. I'm one of the uh, co-conveners of this group. Uh, where we are trying to find out via various statistical methods if there is evidence of neutrino point sources in the sky in contrast to simply isotropic uh, neutrino emission. 
And here on the left hand side, you can see our uh, sensitivity. Uh, so the, the solid colored line here are sensitivity uh, uh, on the, the flux normalization at various uh, declination angles. And we are mostly sensitive to upgoing uh, muon neutrinos in the northern hemisphere. Uh, this is the reason why the sensitivity here on uh, positive declination in the northern hemisphere is larger than in the southern uh, sky. But we have partner observatories like Antares in the Mediter Mediterranean, which are observing from the northern hemisphere into the southern hemisphere, and uh, they can nicely complement us in terms of sensitivity. And there are also future projects like CAM3Net or um, by Carl G GVD that are observing from the northern hemisphere to, to really get a full sky uh, coverage of uh, and test of neutrino sources. So the bottom line for these point source searches is we have not found strong evidence like five sigma discovery level evidence of sources. We have a very uh, strong indication that there is a, a neutrino emission from blazers and I'm coming back to this point a little later. So I just want to summarize here at this point, basically this, um, um, this tension between these two observations. How can we make this fit together? And, and uh, of course, uh, the, the, the key information uh, is uh, basically, if you, if you have a contribution, uh, the combined isotropic emission of an extragalactic source population in the universe, then the observation of individual sources in this population, of course, depends on the, the overall abundance of these sources and the uh, individual uh, luminosity of these sources. So if you have, uh, so this is here indicated in this sketch, um, of course, you know very well, as you go out to, to redshift up to the Hubble horizon, basically every step in redshift uh, gives you the same contribution in terms of the isotropic flux, uh, individual sources scale like one over distance scale, scale but each slice gives you, give you more and more sources that also scale with distance square. So uh, in terms of the isotropic flux, we basically see all the way in neutrinos to the Hubble horizon before we have to account for source evolutions and uh, of course redshift losses as well. Uh, but then in terms of a, a point source a population study and individual sources, we uh, will be dominated by very close by sources in, in the sample. And then it becomes a question, how rare uh, are sources in the universe to uh, observe also the individual sources from this isotropic combined emission. And you can do this in terms of two key parameters, which is the source density and the source luminosity. And um, this is, uh, indicated on the slide. So this is basically the situation. Yeah, we have an overall uh, emission of neutrinos and we are trying to find uh, individual components. So we have to know what to look for. And of course, we, we know various candidate sources uh, of um, uh, neutrino emitters. And we can, um, so this is here, if you, for example, focus here uh, on the left-hand side, this is a study of um, uh, continuous neutrino sources in the universe, uh, candidates of, of those. The magenta line shows you a combination of the effective neutrino luminosity uh, on the horizontal axis and the, the local density of the sources, which are required to um, reach the level of the isotropic flux that we see in ice cube. So this, is, uh, this, this would correspond to sources that populate along this line. And uh, in blue, you, you basically see the, the region of this parameter space, which is um, excluded on a statistical level because we don't see bright uh, sources coming from the closest sources of the sample. And uh, if you compare our non-observation of individual sources in terms of our discovery potential and the isotropic emission, you see that some of these sources are basically ruled out as strong emitters of the flux in particular rare sources like, uh, like blazers, FSRQs or BLUX. And, uh, but, but there are other source candidates which are more abundant in the universe. For example, starburst galaxies that could still be contributors uh, of the astro astrophysical isotropic flux, but uh, it would still be consistent that we haven't seen these sources as individual uh, neutrino emitters. So here on the left-hand side, you see this exercise for uh, continuous source, sources, steady neutrino emission. 
You can do the same exercise also for transient sources. Here again, we have uh, uh, non-observations of transient sources compared to the isotropic flux. And uh, again, rare sources in the universe, like um, high luminosity gamma ray bursts, are not expected to be the main uh, contributors to uh, the isotropic flux. Again, this is a busy plot, uh, but it's, it's really just a simple estimate of two key parameters of the population, its luminosity and its local densities. Of course, there are next to leading effects, uh, order effects like how the source population evolves with redshift. And, and this is also the reason why these bands here have a, have a certain width due to the uncertainty of this. Now, uh, let me pick out two of these sources, uh, gamma ray bursts. I already talked about this at the beginning. If you have a binary neutron star merger, you would expect to see a, a short uh, gamma ray burst. And also for a massive uh, star, uh, the cocolops of massive star, you would expect to see long duration gamma ray bursts. So these have been speculated for a very long time as potential neutrino sources. And in IceCube, we have been uh, looking for a neutrino mission uh, basically from the start of our uh, detector for many, many years. And unfortunately, the story here is that we haven't seen any strong uh, emission of these neutrinos. Um, this is here showing a result of a study which is looking for prompt neutrino emission within 100 seconds of the gamma ray uh, display based on uh, about 1200 uh, gamma ray bursts. In, um, uh, in dashed, you can see model predictions of um, the neutrino emission coming from these sources, which are based on the uh, observed gamma ray display as a target background for cosmic ray interactions and estimates for the cosmic ray luminosity in these sources. So these model predictions from the literature are shown in dashed lines and as solid lines, you see the upper limits that we can derive uh, in IceCube. So you see that uh, GRB models for neutrino emission are already highly constrained by our, uh, our non-observation, at least uh, some of them. But if you now also compare here the level of uh, these limits to the, the overall neutrino flux that we see in, in isotropic emission, uh, this upper limit here is at the level of about 1% of the isotropic flux. And this is here, uh, shown on the right hand side in a model independent way in, uh, in blue, uh, you see the different uh, isotropic neutrino measurements with IceCube and uh, the um, half decade bins that you see here um, as, as dashed lines, uh, as, as solid lines, are the upper limits uh, um, in individual energy bins, and the dashed lines are corresponding to integrated limits across a wide energy range. And so at the moment, uh, we can constrain the contribution of gamma ray bursts to the isotropic emission to the level of about 1%. So gamma ray bursts uh, are not expected the, uh, to be the main uh, contributors of the isotropic emission, but of course they can to some level be neutrino emitters and in ICU we continue to follow up uh, gravitational waves in our future analysis. And, uh, well, I said we have been observing gamma ray bursts for a fairly long time. Um, so this is not really a new story in terms of ice cube. Uh, of course, uh, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, gamma ray bursts are very interesting multi-messenger objects. And we have seen uh, uh, this in 2017 when we first observed gravitational waves from a short gamma ray burst in coincidence with uh, gamma rays observed with Fermi and Integral. And uh, of course, IceCube uh, also um, played some part in, uh, well, not some, some part, but we were also very interested in, in observing neutrinos uh, coincident with this particular gravitational wave gamma ray burst event in 2017. And uh, we analyzed this particular source as well in terms of uh, neutrino energy. Unfortunately, again, we didn't see any neutrinos. And for the, for the burst uh, emission within uh, 1,000 seconds around the, um, the gamma ray burst display, uh, this is here the uh, a summary of our upper limits with ice cube, again, organized in terms of uh, emission per energy decade. Uh, our partner observatories, uh, Antares and uh, Auger, have also been looking for uh, neutrino events. They also could not identify neutrino emission. What's, um, what's interesting with this particular event is there have been model predictions that uh, would have allowed us to 
to observe these events in terms of neutrinos, they are shown here in dashed uh, uh, red and blue solid lines. Uh, and so if we had observed these events in terms of on-axis emission in order to get the, the large Lorentz, relativistic Lorentz boost from the, uh, the, uh, the high boosted uh, gamma ray uh, outflow, uh, sorry, uh, plasma outflow, then we would have uh, uh, had a chance to observe this object. But by now, we know from the afterglow emission of this uh, GRB that the uh, emission was actually highly off-axis uh, of the order of 15 degrees. And uh, so uh, even though it was possible to observe these events in terms of gamma rays, uh, the off-axis emission of neutrinos is expected to be much, much lower than our sensitivity. So it is no surprise that we have not seen uh, neutrinos here, even for these optimistic uh, models. So this was a follow-up of neutrino events from uh, a gravitational wave alert that we observed from LIGO Virgo. In ICU, we also have our own uh, alert program. Uh, so we, um, on, on one hand, we follow up um, uh, gravitational wave events observed with LIGO. And of course, uh, LIGO is not, uh, not operating at the moment. They, they finished their O3 run, but they will start to, to uh, the next observation run in 2021, and we are, we are prepared for that. So when we receive alerts from, uh, from LIGO, uh, Virgo, in terms of uh, gravitational wave candidates throughout the universe, we have a program that reacts in real time to look if there are an, any interesting neutrino events in the ice cube detector. And if we see something interesting, we send out messages to the community. So um, this is here uh, one example where this actually happened on July 28, 2019. This was during the ICRC conference in medicine, or the beginning of the conference. There was such a gravitational wave event uh, which is indicated here in terms of the sky map. So the red contour here is the estimated uh, location of the uh, gravitational wave source. And we found one neutrino candidate within uh, a short period of time around this event that was consistent with the um, um, likelihood uh, contour. Um, and so this, this is an event that we sent out. And you can see here from the comparison of the, the angular uncertainty of the neutrino event and the uncertainty of the location of the source, that this is actually quite helpful if you want to uh, design a follow-up program with an with a electromagnetic observatory uh, to, to prior prioritize the region in the sky you want to uh, start your search. So if you have a very large gravitational wave footprint like, like this event, you have to, of course, devise a, a method of, of, of scanning and observing this region. And actually, our information was use, used by uh, SWIFT uh, XRT to uh, devise a search region which is prioritizing on the arrival direction of the neutrino event in this region. So uh, this is basically showing that there is um, uh, an enormous uh, potential for these uh, multi-messenger observation and communication to optimize uh, observation strategies across different uh, multi-messengers, different observatories. Uh, here again, unfortunately, we, um, uh, the, uh, the SWIFT observatory could not find any significant emission in the search pattern. And uh, uh, also the, the one neutrino event that we observed from the source is not a very high significance. Uh, but ISCUBE also has its, its own um, search program. How, how are we doing in time, actually? I'm getting already close to the end, right? So uh, maybe, maybe let, let me wrap up this particular part of the story. Maybe five more minutes, is it five enough? Minutes? Okay, good. Uh, so this is here. So ISCUBE also has its own um, alert program. So we have these uh, very energetic astrophysical neutrinos that we observe from time to time. And if we see basically uh, neutrinos at the end of our spectrum, we send these neutrino out as alerts, which can then be followed up by the community uh, in terms of electromagnetic emission. And we have two types of alerts, gold events at very high energies with a high probability that they come from astrophysical sources and uh, lower energy events, which are called bronze events. So these events uh, happen at the rate of 10 events per year. So once per month for gold events, and a little more often for these bronze events. And one of these events, um, one of these gold events, 
was actually followed up by, um, by Fermi um, in 2017. So 2017 was a great year for multi-messenger astronomy. And they could find, uh, a, um, so this is, this is here the event, uh, which is a, a muon neutrino uh, uh, with an estimated energy of about 300 uh, tera, electron, tera electron volt, so uh, very high energy. And uh, um, uh, for, uh, Magic and Fermi could identify uh, that this uh, neutrino alert was actually coincident with a known gamma ray blazer, TXS 0506 plus 056. And what's interesting was that at the time of the observation, this blazer was actually in a flaring state. And uh, you probably followed the story. We, we had a science publication coming out of this. The estimated chance correlation of these events with this particular blazer is at the level of uh, three sigma. And um, the, the blazer is of one, one other source that has been speculated for a very long time as a potential source for neutrino emission very similar to the case of gamma ray bursts, we expect to form shocks in jetted outflows of these objects, which can be regions of cosmic ray acceleration inter interactions. And uh, if you observe these uh, outflows uh, um, uh, within the line of sight, then you have this very strong emphasized uh, blazer emission. And this should also happen for neutrinos. What's uh, even more interesting for this particular source was uh, after the uh, correlation, the observed correlation between uh, Fermi, uh, Fermi source and uh, the alert events, we also went back to our data. We have our, our data on record and we can look back and see if there have been episodes in the past where we observed enhanced neutrino emission uh, from this particular source. And we could actually identify an episode at the end of 2015 where we uh, had a, a burst of uh, about 13 neutrino events coming from that source. And again, this, info, this piece of information, this, this analysis gives us another independent 3.5 sigma evidence that this source has been neutrino, uh, emitting neutrinos at that time. So uh, we, are not, we are not claiming a five sigma discovery of this particular source, but we have two uh, um, pieces of information to three sigma um, evidences of neutrino emission, which combine to compelling evidence that this particular source is actually a neutrino source. And here on the left, you can actually see the, um, the contour of uh, the superposition of these 13 events contributing to the signal, so that you can take this as the first neutrino uh, uh, morphology study of this particular flare. Uh, and then, of course, you can ask the question again, are these sources maybe then the main contributors to the astrophysical neutrino flux? And uh, so we had dedicated analysis in ICEUBE looking for the catalog of other uh, blazer sources observed with Fermi. Again, we could not find very strong emissions similar to the case of gamma ray burst. And presently, our upper limits uh, on the contribution of blazers to the neutrino flux is at, at the level of about uh, 20%. So we are still uh, below 30%. So we are still uh, out uh, looking for neutrino sources. And uh, I think very essential for us in the future uh, will be a partnership with uh, multi-messenger uh, observatories uh, to, um, uh, to have um, a boost of evidence in our combined statistical analysis. So I have to, uh, to come to an end. Unfortunately, I, I did not have much time to, uh, to talk about these very uh, interesting multi-messenger uh, relations. Maybe one word on that. Um, uh, I'm, so I mentioned at the beginning that uh, the intensity... Marcus, it can be more than one word if you want. Yeah, one word. Take your time. Yes. Yeah, so it's... Um, uh, so the neutrino uh, uh, sensitivity here uh, is very um, similar to the intensity that we see in the gamma ray background. And uh, what I, so you, I, I showed you a similar plot earlier on. Here you also see some, some model predictions in terms of dashed and solid lines. And what's very interesting is if you come up with a model, which is shown here as the blue dashed lines, which is at the level of the neutrino intensity that we observe in ice cube. And then if you ca calculate what is the uh, contribution of um, a flux of hadronic gamma ray sources uh, in terms of the cascaded emission that will be uh, contributing to the isotropic gamma ray background in, in, uh, that is observed in, in Fermi, 
you see that this is easily saturating the emission. And there are actually some uh, contributions of neutrinos here at lower energies that seem to exceed this, this bound. So if, if I would calculate the gamma ray contribution from the, the lower end of the spectrum here, this would easily exceed the gamma ray background. So there are some very interesting multi-messenger um, constraints that we have to, to take into account to find uh, uh, neutrino sources in, in the universe. It seems that we have to focus on sources that provide an environment that can absorb the hadronic gamma ray emission that is produced by, by nuclear pions in this mechanism in order to stay consistent with uh, the limits that we get from Fermi on the uh, gamma ray background. Okay, so let's, let's uh, then come to my end, uh, to my summary. So we are living uh, in very exciting times, at least from my point of view, from, from neutrino astronomy and multi-messenger astronomy. We have many new signals and we have uh, uh, find first evidence of multi-messenger uh, sources in the universe a couple of years ago. So this is an ongoing stories, uh, story in IceTube. We still uh, have to find um, uh, a good uh, evidence for individual neutrino sources on top of the first uh, indications that we have seen so far. Very essential are multi-messenger partnerships in the future, uh, also in real time. And of course, we hope also that uh, IceCube is not going to be the last word in terms of the uh, experiments. We are also trying to build uh, larger detectors like IceCube Gen 2, which will be an extended facility, uh, not only uh, in IS optical Schrenkov uh, observations, but also uh, observations of neutrinos with other experimental techniques. Um, but uh, let me come here to, uh, to a close. So thank you very much for your attention. I think Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Marcus. So, thank you. So, so please uh, ask questions. So uh, mute your microphone or raise your hand and we can ask questions. So maybe I can initiate this discussion session. Uh, can I ask you, Marcus, uh, the, the prospects for narrowing down the, uh, what you do in this ternary plot for the flavor? Yeah. Uh, uh, I mean, um, Maybe not with Ice Cube because Ice Cube has been running for some time now. But with uh, Gen Two, what is the pos uh, Do you expect to be able to 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 say something about the flavor composition at the source? Yeah. So I actually uh, I'm just scrolling here through my backup slides. And unfortunately, I don't have the slide that I'm looking for. So we we, we also have this um, um, this effort at the at the South Pole right now, uh, where we are. Um, uh, so this is the slide here. So we, we have this um, um, project which is going to happen in the next few years, which is ice upgrade. With this ice upgrade, we can actually um, make a better estimate of uh, tau neutrino contributions, tau neutrino measurements. And um, but, but th okay, this will be tau neutrino measurements for the atmospheric background. So uh, yes, we have uh, better capabilities with ice cube gen two to to narrow down. The, uh, the flavor uh, contour for our astrophysical neutrino flux. And uh, what uh, I don't have a slide here, but uh, what we will be able to do is we will get a very good handle on the discrimination of the muon neutrino contribution. So in, uh, compared to the, to the plot that I showed you uh, earlier here, so we will, we, we will be able to narrow down this, this vertical uh, discrimination of muon, uh, tau, uh, sorry, muon neutrinos. And, uh, but still for the combination of electron and tau neutrinos, uh, 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 yeah, electron and tau neutrinos, uh, we will still be quite uncertain. So what you will see in the future uh, will be shrinked contours like that. And uh, we have the sensitivity to distinguish, um, for example, the, the pure muon neutrino beam from the pure, uh, uh, from the combined uh, muon and pion stream, so the orange compared to the red point. But we will still have some width in the overall contribution, uh, the relative contribution of uh, tau and electron neutrinos, because uh, the way to observe this in ice tube is always in terms of cascades. So it's, there's not a very strong handle on electron to tau neutrino flavors. I see. So when you say that you will be able to distinguish the, so the, the pure muon from the, the mixed composition, that's with ice cube or with gen two? So, uh, so, this, uh, so the ice cube upgrade uh, will already uh, help to some extent because uh, with the ice cube upgrade, 
we also get a better um, um, understanding of systematic uncertainties in the ice. So that the main driver of systematic uncertainty in the ice is the newly frozen ice columns in the vicinity of the optical modules. So with ice upgrade, we will have some studies of how, uh, what the optical properties of these, uh, these new ice columns are. And this will then go back, uh, feedback to our previous analysis. We can do better, for example, better angular reconstructions of cascade events. And this will then inform our past data. So we can do a second pass of our old data. And this will eventually lead to a shrink down of these uncertainties uh, in terms of uh, flavors. So okay. already with ICU upgrade, of course, with ICU Gen 2, with uh, larger event numbers, we can also improve it. I see. Okay. And maybe coming back to this uh, Texas Blazer, the TXS, uh, you said that what you saw in 2013 was a 3.5 sigma evidence. Yep. Mm -hmm. When you say it's independent evidence, so that means that in your data by 2014 or 2015, you had yeah. this 3.5 sigma evidence. Yeah. So my question is, uh, why didn't you point this out? Mm -hmm. or yeah. Did so, you see uh, it or was it hidden in your data? Yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's a very interesting story. I'm not sure how much time I have, but so basically we, we had uh, already at, at that time, uh, after 2015, a search for transient sources uh, in the entire sky. So basically we, we tile our sky in, in pixels and then we are looking for evidence of transient neutrino source emission independent of any source catalog. And because we have so many um, trials, so many lo locations in the sky, in order to minimize our trial factor, we only select the most significant um, evidence of um, transient neutrino emission in the northern and in the southern hemisphere. So this particular flare was actually observed with this catalog, but it was the second brightest flare. So there was a, a random fluctuation, which was basically then picked up by our analysis. And we failed basically to look for the, you know, the, 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 maybe the 10 most significant of these flares and try to see if they are correlating with some interesting um, um, sources in the sky. Uh, yeah, you have to keep in mind, we have a lot of analysis of our data and we are always reanalyzing the same data. So we have to be very careful with trial corrections. Eventually it's uh, just from background fluctuation. Uh, if, if you are, <laughs> the number of analysis uh, increases, you will always eventually find some three sigma results. So we have to very, be very careful for that. And that is the reason why this analysis was constrained to only look for the brightest source. But, but uh, you can, I can show you a sky map from that time. You could already see the source as a, a faint dot in the, the p-value from this particular location of the blazer. Thank you. Okay. So I think, Michel, yeah, Michel, you have a question? Yes. I would like to come back to this blazer you detected. Yeah. In fact, you detected only one, but there yeah. are several very bright blazers which are known on the other hand, and in the optical, we see from time to time optical flares. So what should one deduce from the fact that in those other cases, you did not detect the neutrino? Is it that special conditions are required, or is it that the jet is so narrow that it's very rarely just pointed toward us? Yeah, so uh, uh, that, that's, that's of course the exactly right question. And so the, the short answer to that, I don't know. <laughs> so uh, well, what's, what's particular with this source is, so we picked up on TXS by seeing a high energy neutrino event. One of these events uh, in 2017, which was coincident with the gamma ray flare. Then we go back in data and then we see 13 of these events. But uh, of course, we can also then look if Fermi at that time was observing some excited emission from the source and there is nothing, yeah? So if this particular source is a neutrino source, it has a, uh, must have a very interesting property which uh, produces these two different emission uh, episodes with different intensities of neutrinos, which somehow seems to anti-correlate with, uh, with the gamma ray flux. The reason why we um, pick, picked up this source is maybe also, so it's, it's one of the brighter gamma ray bursts. Uh, uh, one of the brighter. And it also appears in the part of the sky where we are uh, particularly sensitive. So we are, you know, we are trying to see upgoing neutrinos. Um, but uh, if, we, if we look for neutrinos which are coming from um, the, uh, 
the North Pole, then there's a lot of absorption of neutrinos in the Earth. So the, the sweet spot for our analysis is actually a slice below the horizon. And this particular blazer appears in the slice. So there's a, uh, there's a selection effect from the detector that is also built in. And this might also be a reason why we don't pick up on other sources. Uh, but uh, yeah, so there, there have been various, um, of course, theory papers after our observation uh, to try to make sense of these uh, observations, in particular the one in 2017. A lot of these publications were arguing it is, it's not expected to see uh, one, this one event in 2017 to begin with, because if you do leptohedronic or hadronic models of laser emission, uh, this is actually mostly determined by the leptonic emission. There's not much room for extra hadronic components. But then you also have to take into account uh, that there is some um, selection bias, addicting bias. So if you have like a population of sources, uh, let's say you have 10 sources in the universe where you expect to see maybe uh, 0.1 neutrino events, then the combination of these sources will uh, give you an expectation of one. And then it becomes a lottery which of these sources are picked up by our detection. It, it's, um, yeah, so the bottom line here is this is, this is basically an, an interesting question why this particular source? And uh, we also have various uh, follow up analysis in IceGroup that is basically trying to uh, look for correlation of neutrino emission with broadband emission of the blazers, also in the X ray region, which seems to be a very good way to constrain the neutrino emission. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Do we have other questions? Um, I have one question, Martin, that's not terribly serious, but uh, <laughs> so Marcus, um, uh, do you have any, uh, are you able to detect terrestrial sources of neutrinos inside the detector? And is that a problem for you? Terrestrial sources of neutrinos. Um, From the reactors and things no. like that. We, uh, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there are of course also uh, anthropic backgrounds which can interfere with our electronics. Uh, uh, and we had like cases of like radar emission in, in, in the past uh, from from over over flights of, of um, planes. But uh, so we will not. So we are not sensitive to this neutrino emission unless you have maybe an atom bomb which is exploding very close to the south pole then you would actually also expect to see uh, the low energy neutrino burst in terms of a uh, of uh, an increased background rate and uh, you have other problems though we have other problems yeah but but uh, it's, uh, so these um this enhancement of backgrounds, that is actually a way also to, uh, to look for galactic low energy neutrino emission from uh, Corcolob supernovae. So this is another uh, uh, part of our program. We are part of SNUS, the supernova uh, early warning system. And uh, neutri the neutrino observatory will not be able to decipher the location of a supernova in our galaxy. But uh, we, will, uh, we are very, very sensitive um, to the overall neutrino emission from these sources. So we will see a, a, an increase of our background rate due to electron neutrino scattering with, with neutrons in the ice. And uh, uh, this would actually be probably the most sensitive probe for the neutrino light curve from corporate supernova, much superior than other uh, smaller facilities. Okay, thank you. So, Marcus, the, I think it's the, the separation between the detectors that sets the minimum energy that you can observe. Is that right? Yeah. So, the, what is that minimum energy? Uh, so, uh, so for ice, so the for the main ice cube array, the uh, uh, the threshold is of the order of um, TeV. Uh, we also have um, you know this this low energy infill uh, in ice cube, which is called deep core. Uh, that has a, a smaller, um, so this is seen here, a deep core. These are uh, six extra string, which are, uh, which have a closer string-to-string uh, -string separation, and they have a threshold of the order of 10 giga electron volt. Yeah, so you can um, lower the threshold there. We, we are using this mostly for dark matter analysis, looking for indirect uh, neutrino uh, uh, emission of dark matter annihilation or decay. And it's also a very valuable part if we do os uh, atmospheric neutrino oscillation studies uh, with this deep core. But of course, it's a smaller detector, so it's not as sensitive. 
For IceCube um, Gen 2, we actually plan to go to uh, interspring spacing of 240 meter. So this will be twice the sp uh, string spacing that we have presently in IceCube. And uh, this will have a higher detection uh, thresh threshold, which is geared towards um, the energy uh, range that we observe now, where we have a strong confidence that we see this astrophysical neutrino flux. Mm -hmm. So we have to do a, a compromise. If we had more money, of course, we would uh, have a denser infill. And of course, there are, there are other projects um, uh, at, at la larger energies, for example, the, the Grand uh, uh, experiment. I know that Kumiko Kotera, who, who uh, could not be here today, uh, she's, she's working with this experiment focusing on EEV neutrino emission, which is also a very interesting region in terms of ultra high energy cosmic rays. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. So, well, if there is no more question, maybe we can stop here. And thank you again very much, Marcus. Uh, yeah, thank you, Marcus. Great questions, also. Thank you. Thank you.